Hey everybody, it's Lou Santiago, and I want you guys to know we have, in my opinion, the coolest guest ever tonight. That's right, the coolest guy. His name is Dennis McCarthy. And let me tell you something. I wish I had his job. Well, maybe not the stress level, but it's definitely a cool job. And so will you after tonight. Because if you don't know who Dennis McCar McCarthy is, I was ready to say McCartney. He doesn't sing. This is, this is another guy. This guy's better. You will and you will dig what he does. So we're going to do a quick break. Come back with John. We're going to talk a little bit and then going to bring in Dennis. So you guys sit back. Enjoy the ride. Let's do this. Three lefts don't make a right. What you need to do is check out DEI, Design Engineering Incorporated. They keep the heat out so you're not sweating to death. Check them out. <laughs> John! I'm here. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here as usual. <laughs> So, Dude, I almost, cool. I almost said McCartney. <laughs> I, no, I like, heard oh. you. I was like, what the yeah. hell? <laughs> that's like when I had to, that's like when I was talking about uh, uh, Tom, ba Tom Bailey. Someone said that I said Tom Davis or something like that. I don't know. I yeah. might have. If I did, I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah, in the, in the message to me, it's a Davis. I went with what you said. I got corrected Davis. a couple times on social media saying, nah, it's Bailey. I'm like, I, you're right. I said, it's Lou. What do you want from me? Yeah, I, I admit I'm a train wreck. I try not to do that. But I, <laughs> hey, before we really get crazy, guys, at 45 minutes into the show, 215-469-81. God, see, the dyslexia is kicking in. 215-469-1892. That's the number to call in. Now, remember, don't be a wanker about it. Be civilized, all right? So what do you got going on today, John? I mean, you know, we got some cool stuff happening. Uh, I think uh, Dennis is a, a, a cool guest. I got to tell you that uh, I talked to him a few times on the phone a couple of years back, and there was a couple of stories he told me that uh, I hope he hits on tonight. One of them was they wrecked a car in Europe for, I think it was a, a Fast and Furious movie, but he said that they had to FedEx a car, pushed it onto an airplane. They were shutting down production. The paint was still wet. The coolest thing, though, is they hand. This is the part I like most because when we pay to go see a movie and you something pops up, whether it's a charger, or it's whatever it is, and you go, "Oh, look at that! That's cool as shit." Dennis is the guy that makes the decision that says this belongs here, this car fits this character. They give him the script, and he makes it fit. He suits him up with the appropriate car, appropriate actions. If they're going to drop it out of a plane, they're going to do something crazy with it, need it to drive backwards at 80 miles an hour, he's the guy. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Figures it out, makes it happen. Yeah, that, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, The roughest true. part, I think, is trying to fit it within a budget. I have no idea oh, how you would do that because you know within three seconds sometimes they're destroying the thing. Yeah. Yeah, and well, and he, think about it. You know, he, he's probably building a serious amount of cars. I so he's, he's got a small army that he's dealing with to get these cars done, too. My memory's not as good as it used to be, but I thought he told me 300 in a matter of months on some projects. 300 cars. Really? Can you imagine that? That's insane, man. That's insane. You That's want to run through, on the top of the list, go through his, just some of his projects that he's right, done. Some, 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 some of the movies that he's done, he's he supplied cars for these. Bruce Almighty, Batman Begins, Meet the Fockers, Live Free, Die Hard, The Green Hornet, Batman versus Superman, Captain Marvel, Jumanji, Black Panther, and of course, Fast. So, yeah, he's done some serious movies, man. Which is cool, yeah. because if you look at it, they're all different types of cars. You know, I mean, it's not just one genre that he's got here. So that's really neat. But let's, but real quick, real quick. Don't you have horse TV next week? Before I we do, get. I do. Uh, actually, I got horse TV tomorrow. I got to jet out to Ohio. Okay. So I got to shoot. Uh, it's the 45 day meetup for the trainers for the uh, rescue program. Okay. Ken and Ryan uh, are going too. Oh, are they? Yeah, the producer and director of behind yeah. the scenes here. We're all we're all heading out. But yeah, we just got done the trailer. I posted it online. Uh Horse TV loves the the trailer for it. So everything's heading in the right direction. But enough about me. Nobody gives a shit about what I'm doing. 
I was just curious. You got problems. Dennis probably has two hours worth of uh, material yes, to go let's, through. Let's turn around. Dennis has got, and, and his time is important. His time, he's a busy man, unlike us. So you guys remember at 45, at the 45 minute mark, we're going to start taking calls. 215-469-1892. When we get back, it's going to be Dennis talking about cool cars. One hey, thing. Guys. Wait a minute. One thing for what, you, Jeff. What? Ryan said he was getting calls all through the night, the whole weekend, people 2 a.m. throughout the weekend because it was going to his cell phone. If you're not watching it live, of course, Ryan knows now how to shut it off now. He figured all, all that out. But if you're not watching live, <laughs> you can't call in live. You're going to get a recording. But he said he had a million recordings. He said everything was all backed up. So I just wanted to tell you that, you know. We, I, that's funny. That's the last funny. show with Rawlings did 300 and some thousand people or some nonsense. It was It was a pretty big deal. I got a lot of viewers on that. Just wanted to tell you what happened to your favorite Hollywood stars. Some are screen legends. That's a Carla. Some made history. What do you say? Is it the new blues mobile or what? One thing's for sure, they all have more to tell. Road trip with me, Lou Santiago, as I hunt down these iconic cars. Cars actually stolen. My kids said, Dad, you're not going to believe what's over here. And take you behind the scenes. To get the story behind the story. I'm gonna have the car do the same thing. Pow, bang, wow. From the designers who built them, the stars that drove them, and the lucky motherfuckers who stumbled across them. Where was his car when he found it? Pull in there, pull in there. Dude, tell me you have your hands on it. You're not gonna believe some of this stuff. Yo, the it's iconic. I iconic is tonight. I mean, we're actually doing an episode of Iconic. With I know him. it's insane. You it's know insane. what I mean? You're right. So we get to figure out who, what, where. There, he, there is. he is in his shop. Dennis, how you doing? Good. How you guys doing? Hanging good, in good. there, man. Doing what we do, <laughs> causing problems. <laughs> I got Dennis. Before we get any further, what's the deal with that tri five behind you at fifty seven? Yeah, that car's a. Uh, it's. It's a car that I worked at a shop when I was 16 years old. This guy used to come in to buy race gas, and it was just on my list of cars to have. The guy, unfortunately, passed away about seven, eight years ago, and uh, I know the kids. After a little bit of time, I ended up uh, finally striking a deal, but uh, it's a bitching car. It's a four-speed factory fuel-injected car, and it just sits right. You know, it's just got a slam. Really? It's just slam. It's got the real magnesium wheels on it, but it just, you know, it's – it just has the right look, you know, if you guys can see it Dude, at all. That car's badass. Yeah, it just it's uh it's just one of those cars that I don't drive it a lot, but when I do, you know, I'm definitely smiling. So Right, right, that right, right, badass. right. That's that's badass. That's badass. Dennis, when you we talked the other day you, and we were uh, iron out today the schedule, you said you were on a stunt gig. Tell us about what your day's like on an average day. What did you do? Yeah, what, what does that include? Yesterday, and this is a, the one thing about my business, everything changes, it seems like, by the minute. So uh, the stunt <laughs> I was referring to yesterday changed into just a test today. But uh, I'm doing a movie right now with uh, being directed by a really good friend of mine, J.J. Perry. It's, uh, it's a movie about vampires and trophy trucks and dirt bikes and, you know, all, all my favorite things. Maybe not the vampire part being one of my favorites, but all the automotive and motorized vehicles being one of my favorites. But uh, So we were just doing some shock valving, testing, doing some jumps. It's a shot where it has to... Uh, clear a fence that's about six feet with the arc the thing will be probably 12 feet in the air to land on the highway so uh you know not a bad day at work when you get to go out and uh be on some off-road stuff so wait a minute i my my question's always been when you see stuff like that how do you guys figure out the speed the arc how do you how do you figure that all out there's got to be some kind of formula right well there's 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 two ways and it depends on uh, who you're working with um you know i've worked with uh stunt coordinators and effects coordinators that will literally spend, you know, weeks plotting it out on a computer program and, you know, doing all sorts of math. And then there's other guys that can look at it and go, yeah, I think that's going to be right at about 70 miles an hour. It's going to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You might try with a dirt bike first, you know, hit it with a motorcycle. Yeah, it looks good, which is really the way that I prefer. And both ways work. Don't get me wrong. You know, both are always successful. Um, but the movie on I'm on right now, it's been more about, you know, these guys have a ton of experience. Uh, you know, it's uh, JJ Perry is actually a stunt man by, you know, originally, and now he's a director, but uh, you know, the guys he hires are the best in the business and, you know, they can look at a situation and know what it's going to take to get it done. Right. And, right, right. Smaller, you start a little bit slower, you just kind of work your way up and uh, 
you know, I think at the end of the day, that that method actually is a little more efficient. Obviously, if you're doing something crazy huge, yeah, then you want to do then you want to do everything possible. But uh, for what we're doing on this one, it's more uh, Dukes of Hazard style. You know, just getting some big air and uh, making it work. So. That's do you awesome. do you end up trashing that? Do you? I mean, at the beginning, do you know when you're testing it, there's going to be a test where you're going to trash it? The card that you worked with recently, today, yesterday, is it a survivor? And how do you how do you prep for that? How do you build a car out and be able to survive? So today's an easy one because uh, the truck we're using actually is an off road race truck, so it was designed to do it. So oh, yeah, does it with with uh, absolutely effortless. Now, if we were jumping, uh, you know, whatever a Dodge Charger, a Crown Vic, you know, we were doing the same jump on the pavement which we've done, it's not going to be a survivor. So in that case, um, if we're dealing with a, an expensive car, I'll try to find a stand-in car, almost a stunt car for the stunt car. You know, something like a, maybe if it's a brand new Charger or a Hellcat, we're going to find like maybe a Dodge, or we'll find like maybe a Ford Crown Vic. You know, something the same weight, we'll scale it, we'll add weight, we'll subtract weight, we'll get the balance right, and we'll, you know, we'll jump a $1,500 car for testing. And that way we're not, you know, just throwing money away. So right, right, it makes sense. That's I mean, pretty. Cool. You know, because I mean, I'm sure the budgets are pretty ridiculous at times, and then you got to stay within that. You know, I mean, right? I mean, I would imagine. Yeah. No. So no matter what the budget is, uh, the goal is to stay within the budget. Um, right. I, I've I've done movies that have literally you know a hundred and fifty thousand dollar budget to you know movies that have a twenty million dollar budget. So there's a huge range that I deal with, and. Um, but yes, don't ever give them one number. Just like just like any of your car work done. You know, you go drop the car off to get a motor put in it. The guy tells you it's fifty five hundred bucks. You don't want to show up and pay seventy five hundred. So right. exact concept with the studios. They're not gonna like it if I give them a number and I don't stick to it. Got you. Got you. That's that's, crazy. that's pretty interesting. Dennis, let's it back is. up. Let's back up because this is not something you wake up or go to school or you have to have experience in what, what you're doing or or somebody's gonna get hurt. You're going to lose money. I mean, this is it's pretty you know, Lou, like we were talking and Lou said at the intro, it's a pretty cool job. I mean, there's cool jobs, but this is a pretty cool job to be doing this for a living and jumping cars, building cars and figuring out what, what fits what. But you didn't wake up learn, you know, knowing this. Tell us how you got started. Tell us from the beginning, you know, who was your influence and how did you get into the movies? Well, I guess I'll start by saying this is a business that I didn't know even existed you know i i uh i've always been in the cars from day one uh, i think since i was born i've been in the cars you know so that's always what i've worked on played with whether it was bicycles go-karts mini bikes you know you name it um out of uh right out of high school i think it was more of a punishment you know my parents were like so sick of me working on cars and going to street races and all that stuff it was a punishment to send me away to a trade school you know it's like <laughs> i'm saying that you know if all you're going to do is work on cars and we're sending you out of here. It's like, all right, you know, all right. You know, so anyways, I ended up in Arizona at a school, literally, literally the morning after I graduated from high school and, uh, you know, just had a great time. You know, once again, I was, then I was hanging out with a whole bunch of car guys, you know, when I was in high school, right. <clears throat> 12 of us that were pretty hardcore into it. Once I went to this automotive school, it's like, man, everybody here's in the cars. So, uh, <coughs> you know, I instantly ended up getting into more trouble in Arizona than I got into in high school. Because, uh, you know, I was just with that crowd, you know, so, uh, right. so anyways, that just really kind of led into, uh, you know, I mean, pretty much all my jobs as a kid were at speed shops or at, you know, automotive shops or, uh, worked at a dyno shop. And I think, uh, God, I don't think I was 21. I opened up my first business, uh, you know, working on hot rods because I realized early on that this is a, was a huge mistake on my part. I realized I didn't want to change, you know, a water pump on a Ford Granada. I didn't want to do a Trans and a Pinto. You know, I want to put a V8 in a Vega. You know, I'm going back, right. I'm going back to the 80s here, but uh, because I figured that's where the money's at. I soon and quickly realized that the money is not in working on hot rods. You know, it's you can be passionate about it. You can want to do it. And, and granted, it there are ways to make a lot of money in it. But from an automotive shop standpoint, I realized maybe a few years after doing nothing but hot rods, that the uh, like the studio fleet accounts actually made money. You know, car comes in, it comes out. Yeah. Sitting there on the bandsaw and grinding and making a set of headers fit for four hours that you can only charge a customer an hour and a half to install them. You know, so uh, you know, I learned quickly that I had to do both. So, which is part of what led me to what I do today because I picked up a couple of accounts with uh, one was uh, NBC Studios and I had a, a really great account with 
Disney Studios, basically servicing uh, and maintaining all their malls, you know, from uh, vehicles to stake beds to, uh, to semis, you know, everything. And uh, what that really did is it kind of, uh, it got me exposed into the studios because I would drive in and out of these lots to drop off cars, pick up cars, and vice versa, uh, drivers for the studios would come into my shop and there was always something cool there that we're working on, which led me to a producer that was into cars. So I started working on his personal cars. That in turn led me to building the first cars for a movie, which was back, uh, gosh, probably back in 1998. And, uh, you know, and that was cool. You know, I did some work on a movie. I go, wow, this is pretty, pretty interesting. This is something different. <laughs> first thing you notice is their budget is bigger than the guy coming in to get that uh, started. Yeah plumbing truck you know I was like wow this seems really interesting and what shocked me was and this is the first time I'd ever experienced this they was they said hey we want you to come out to set and just stand by I go just stand by yeah yeah just stand by in case something breaks or goes wrong okay great so I would go out there I'd sit there for 12 hours 15 hours and get paid for doing nothing so it was like the weirdest concept to me ever so I just, <laughs> yeah <laughs> all these cars and get everything out the door but now these guys are paying me just to get case something broke so um you know a little bit more time went on and it just got more and more interesting and uh you know at some point i made that decision you know what this is this is what i need to do you know and it seemed especially going back then there were not that many car guys doing what i did you know it just it would seem like i kind of had a niche at that point where wow this is uh you know i'm going to be in demand movie cars are always needed and i think Previously to that, I mean, I, there's always exceptions. There's some great guys back back in those days. But, you know, movie cars were kind of, yeah, just make it work. Just, yeah, oh, he wants to slide it. Well, just, you know, tighten up the e-brake cable and, you know, put a pair of vice grips on the e-brake release. Yeah, you know, the I've done that. Of stunt car prep. You know, if it was a rollover car, they would do something like say, uh, yeah, hey, why don't you just tie a rope to the ground so if he flips a car, he can grab the rope and tuck himself down, you know. So <laughs> we've completely changed that. Obviously, nowadays, if we're going to wreck a car or crash a car, um, you know, we build it basically to race car standards. I mean, the roll cage, the seat, uh, you know, seat belt mounting is, is critical. You know, yeah. the mounting is critical. Uh, you know, head and neck restraint. I mean, it's really, in the time I've been in this business, it has come so far, it's, it's unbelievable. And I mean, on the, on the plus side of that, you know, guys don't get hurt. You know, it just, I mean, right. I have I get hurt for you know 10 12 years you know knock on uh, knock on sheet metal but uh, you know it's really uh, I feel just come up to another level that's cool Dennis, who, who was your influences early who did you work with early on there's somebody else that was doing the job slightly doing the job I mean who's who was your guy well that's the funny thing when I got into this business um, I didn't have anybody to show me what to do you know what I mean I mean I came into this business yeah. with movie cars just kind of doing it my own way, you know, and uh, I did probably three or four movies that way. Just basically uh, buy the movies like I did at my own automotive shop, you know. Right. Satisfaction was just kind of uh, kind of my goal. And I felt when I got in this business that customer satisfaction wasn't the normal. You know, it was more of a, of a union job. It's like, hey, you know, that's what you get and, uh, you know, hope you like it. Whereas I, on the other hand, was trying for 100% satisfaction. So... I think that's one of the things that's really uh, allowed me to excel in this business and, uh, you know, keep it all going. This yeah. Is- yeah, because I know from doing TV that, it, you know, you have cars that are TV done. You know what I mean? They don't they don't care if it runs or not. It's TV done. And as long as the show is done, they're happy. So you got, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about because Jared and myself, we would always be, no, we got to do it right. We got to do it right. And they would get mad at us. They get, you know, it's, like, dude, it's our name that's on the line, you know? Yeah, it's that's, crazy. Uh, that's something, too, that uh, kind of changed when I got into this business. When I came into this business, uh, the vehicles in a TV show or a feature were handled by the transportation department. Now, the transportation department handles all the trailers, all the moving, all the trucks, you know, basically moving the entire company wherever it needs to go. And so cars were always kind of like a, a sideline. Oh, yeah, transportation, they handle the cars. But it wasn't their main gig. So when I got into the business, it was just really by circumstance on, uh, it was actually on Tokyo Drift that I started and basically established Picture Cars as its own entity. So 
I didn't work any other, I didn't work under, yeah, there you go. Good, good shot of that was our Tokyo Drift Warehouse. So, and the reason that I was able to separate from transportation on that is because we started so early to put all these cars, there was not a transportation quarter on the show. So I the transportation side of picture cars, which would include, uh, you know, drivers, stake bed, fuel truck, car carriers, all that and the building, the mechanics, the equipment, the support, everything needed. And it's really just kind of turned, you know, the business of picture cars into its own department and its own entity. And, you know, transportation is their thing. We do, we do our thing. Wow. Dude, that's yeah. awesome. You yeah. crap. That result, you know, across the board. Yeah. yeah. Let's fast forward. That That's the beginning of some of the, the workings of it. But from what I read, and maybe you even told me this, they hand you a script, and I'm guessing you, you're you one of the first guys they give it to. You're in that team or one of the first that tries to figure out where, how, who, and what. So they hand you a script, and they go, we, we need this car to do this, or we need this vehicle to you know be able to look this way. Tell us about that, that process, and I'm more curious, too, about sizing up, picking out a vehicle, one, to fit the need, and to the fit the personality of whoever that is to make it because it has to be a cool physical person. It has to, you know, if it's a, a villain, it's got to be, a, you know, an evil looking car. So it has to fit it's like wardrobe almost, but a vehicle. Tell us about that process of receiving that script and what that's all about. Yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely right. It's really like uh, you know, a casting agent trying to put the right character in the movie. We're trying to put the right car in the movie with the right character. So. Uh, and, uh, you know, getting the strip early, like you mentioned, is true, but that really only applies to a car movie. You know, if it's a movie all about cars, then that, that would be absolutely the case. Um, there's a, you know, I've had a lot of great, I mean, that's one of my favorite parts. I mean, to give you an example with the uh, Fast and Furious franchise, Chris Morgan's done more of them than anybody else, at least that I've worked on. Actually, no, he has done written more than anybody else. And uh, he would start talking to me very early on uh during the process saying hey you know what do you think about this what do you think about that what car should we have here and uh and it's great to be you know in on that at that early those early stages because it prevents the studio or other people getting their minds set on something that's not correct so um mm. the right car is in the right place and uh like like you mentioned it's about putting the right car matching the car with the character and you know, so my goal would be if there's a, a car movie, you got a whole bunch of vehicles that you could basically look at that lineup and you would know, hey, that's for so and so. That car fits. You know, with, the audience would already know just by the look of the car, you know, what character it's for. And then the other big element is trying to figure out uh, what does a car have to do on screen? What is the terrain? What environment is it working in? Is it uh, is it in the dirt? It's on pavement? Is it a road course? Is it uh, a car where you're gonna have to have some uh, drift type action going on? Um, you know, all those type of things. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's really just kind of narrowing everything down and saying, okay, this, this car works. And when I get it down to that point, um, that's when I'll usually show, uh, you know, the director, the production designer, the studio head, hey, this is what I envision for this. What do you think? And, you know, it's, it's extremely rare that they say, you know, man, I've got a different idea. I would say, you know, 99 out of 100, it's like, I love it, you know, but every once in a while there's a, you know, director might have a different vision and that's great when they do. We, you know, we adjust, we scratch what we thought up and start all over again and, uh, you know, make sure that, make sure, that, I guess at the end of the day, just want to make sure everybody's happy and the right car is on screen and, it's, and it does its job. Right, right. So on average, how long, like the Green Hornet car, how long would it take you to build one of those? I mean, I'm sure you've standardized as much as you could, right? Yeah, the Green Hornet. That was a that was a really uh, that was a great movie uh, from a picture car standpoint. We actually built twenty nine of those uh, Chryslers. Wow. And the biggest challenge on that film was just trying to track them down. Those they're not uh, an abundant car, you know. I mean, we were getting those cars. Just, I think we got one out of Canada, one out of Florida. I mean, that's how far away we were going to track those cars down. And uh, I would say, you know, if it was just a stunt car, you know, which the stunt cars would include, we were putting at that point. I was just putting uh, like crate big blocks. Uh, they had that ZZ 454 motor, which was yep. pretty nice aluminum head, you know, worked great. Uh, we were running those motors, Turbo 400 trans and a Ford 9 inch in it. And, uh, and they worked great. You know, it was just a really cool stunt car. But I would say beginning to end, uh, that would be probably a two and a half week, three week process max from the time we get the car, paint, body, 
Stunt cars have very minimal interior, which saves a tremendous amount of time. But again, the drivetrain didn't get the exhaust done on it. Um, one of the biggest challenges on that was uh, getting the steering to work right. You know, it was uh, the way that Chrysler's laid out, it has this gigantic steering box. And yeah. uh, it wasn't really practical at that point to redesign the front suspension, the front steering. We just didn't have that kind of time. And I was trying to get a General Motors pump to work with the Chrysler box. And uh, there's a guy here in Sun Valley that's, you know, one of the, uh, you know, old time experts, uh, Tommy Lee. And I remember, man, that was it's something that you would think would be simple and you wouldn't foresee having that issue. But uh, that was one of the biggest challenges, which is getting the pump that would operate with the Chrysler box. And with the problem we kept having, it kept stuffing the release valve into it and sticking it, you know. But anyways, you know, those things you come across. And that's one that will probably never come across again because – it's not a very uh, you know common combination you have right there. Right, right, right. Well, those those are Chrysler Imperials, right? Weren't they? They were. They look like the Imperial, yeah. See, yeah, sure were. Yeah. yeah, I think they were. Uh, we could go '64, '5, and '6. There were some various differences, but those were the three years that we could uh, pull from right there. That's the wild. Time. See, that just seems like fun to me. I mean, it, you know, just having to do stuff like that, just figuring stuff out. That's just awesome. So when you when you turn around and you get these cars done and you ship them there and they they wreck one what happens then i mean do i mean do you do you ship extra cars or do you have to move like they give you a certain amount of time to get them to from point a to point b yeah so like on, on a green hornet film it was pretty easy you know like if we're going out for a night of uh you know of a chase where i know there's a lot of impact in and you know car on car contact you know we'll bring seven eight cars out you know so um, as they wreck cars or smash a fender or a quarter pound of the tire where the car can't be drivable anymore, we just roll out the next car, repair that car. You know, I'll have guys on set, you know, maybe six, seven guys, everything you need to rebuild the car, fix the car, body work. One of, one of the tricks we use is we'll use, uh, we'll get it as smooth as we can, slather it on some Bondo and put black vinyl over it, right? Just for Oh, yeah, yeah. It looks, looks great on screen, you know, I mean, as the car's blowing by at 60 miles an hour, you can't tell. Um, right. But, and it's just kind of this cycle you keep going. And then uh, most of that movie was night shoots. So then uh, first thing in the morning, the cars all come back to the shop, go through them all again, bring them back out for the next night. And you just keep that cycle going, you know, around and around and around, you know, 24 hour deal really. And uh, if the car is total beyond repair, like if the car's hit, we're okay, we're not fixing that one. Then it's just, it goes back to the shop in the morning. Everything is pulled off of it. Motor, trans, rear end, suspension, anything salvageable. It's organized. It's put in our spare parts trailer, so we just keep upping our you know amount of spare parts. Right. It's still run. If you time it right and you plan properly, you know by the end of the movie you'll have a couple cars left that are running, but you'll never have any downtime. So that's all. No downtime. Yeah. Dennis, well, what, let's say you. I mean, you're talking about the ones that are crap when you're finished that are tore up. But what happens to the ones that are still like the hero car that still survive for? And you have two. You usually have one, right? Typically, the one for yeah. the, the so, uh, it always it varies studio to studio, and you know there's a lot of different circumstances there. I mean, for instance, the Green Hornet. I think uh, I know that the character to play, the actor to play Cato. I know that he got one. I think Seth Rogen got one, um, and there was a couple others that were still left, and I don't know whatever happened to those ones. Uh, on a Fast and Furious film, they have a pretty. Uh, a pretty busy afterlife, you know, we tour those cars all over the place, they go to different countries, they go to events, uh, frequently they'll end up in a museum later on. Um, sometimes, like for instance, you, you have the Fast 8 Charger there, like a lot of times we'll take a chassis from the Fast 8 Charger that was still left at Universal, we'll cut that body off, and that will then become a Fast 9 Charger. So, right. uh, frequently we'll just recycle cars. You know, just to uh, it just speeds up the process because we've already got the LS motor in. It's already got the trans, already has the rear end. Um, I think uh, with that particular example, the only thing that had to be altered, we had to move the uh, stretch the wheelbase a little bit because the Fast Nine Charger had about a four or five inch longer wheelbase. We moved the front wheels forward in the fender. Is there is is there anything in your your contract says you can't build an extra one? An extra one? Yeah. An extra yeah. Car. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that probably wouldn't. Be the reason I asked, hold on, I was at an auction over the weekend. The '94 <laughs> Super, you know this, went for five hundred fifty thousand dollars. People were going crazy, right. like five fifty. It was just a crazy number. Shitload of money. 
Now, yeah, even, that, if, uh, even if they hit the same dirt, was on set and could take a picture of it, VIN number, and it's making another charger, 6968 charger, duplicate to the one that's in the, the hero car. Is that in your contract that you can't do that? You know, I've never really read through that, but I would assume that would be a no-go zone. <laughs> uh, people uh, clone these cars constantly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I was shocked. I, I was watching that, too, and I thought, okay, it's going to bring a couple hundred. That was kind of right. the, the number I had in my mind. It's a cool right. car, very, very iconic car to the franchise. But uh, I was pretty blown away that it brought 550. I mean, it kind of tells you, and it just gives you a glimpse into the – the popularity of this franchise and how much people are just completely into it because uh yeah that one was a staggering number for us for a yeah, it's a big it's a big deal. yeah i'm gonna follow up with you with that one because if there's something we need to talk but anyhow <laughs> uh, <laughs> keep it fair dennis keep it fair <laughs> i mean that's it's huge money it's huge oh, money yeah. and it goes on forever i mean if you had let's say the american graffiti cars or anything that's in history you yeah. know you are seriously you're the george barris of the day yeah the people are stepping yeah. over you are Don't, i mean i spent time the day with george talking shit i see a lot of similarities i actually sat with hal needham the smoky and the bandit talked to him about the trans ams yeah. Yeah. He said, none of those cars survived. He said, if you hear that one of them survived, he goes, we beat the shit out of every one of them. And I'm, I was always just curious behind the scenes. It was one of my attractions to go, you know, let me talk to Dennis, because he's now the, the, the king that does this. What happens? Where do they go? If they go to auction, like you're saying, the actors get it. They're agreeing, I want the hero car. I want a car made for me, and it has to stay pristine or whatever it happens, that they, they, they get it. But I'm always just curious as to, you know, what if made another Batmobile? I know there's a shitload of money in building the original. Right. You know, but the, I mean, I think you're, one of the Batmobiles you built was out front of the Magnaflow booth at SEMA three, four years ago, wasn't it? I think yeah. It was four years ago, yeah. Right, that sounds fun. That, that was a, a really fun project, you know, and uh, Richard Magnaflow is always a huge, huge help to us. I can't even, you know, give that guy enough credit for for all he does. I mean, he'll literally come out to the shop and uh, like on that Batmobile or Fast and Furious cars or anything, he'll, he'll make he'll make the centers right in front of you. You know I mean? He'll mock everything up, he'll dig well, he'll get everything set, take it back to his shop, and then he'll come back, you know, a couple weeks later with 10 sets for you. It's yeah, it's, yeah. It's incredible what Magnaflow is uh, capable of down there. Now, when you're in a situation of a jam, I mean, you go from somebody's handing you or sending you an email with the script or what you need of the script, and then you're ramping up your team. It's like, okay, go, we agree. And you're ramping up and saying, I got to bring in my guys. Are your guys movie guys? Or are they car guys? And and also, when you know that you're not going to be able to yourself and your shop with whatever your crew is, you know that you can't hit 300 cars or what have you. Because I think you told me there's 300 per Furious movie. Do you sub out? Who do you sub to? And you know, how do you make all that? That's a lot of work. I mean, Lou was saying, yeah, I'd love to have it. But when you talk about the stress of hitting budget, hitting right. the schedule, that shit ain't easy. I mean, oh. you know, I, I don't know what they pay you, but I'm sure it's not enough. Just you know, hearing that through, you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is cool, but that's got to be, you know, yeah. where's Dennis? Where's Dennis? We want to hang him. Shit ain't right. <laughs> there's got to be a lot of pressure. Can you explain that part of it for us? I know I just hit a lot of the stuff there, but can you explain? Yeah, no, I, mean, I don't really sub anything out. Um, I mean, uh, we get help from a lot of companies. Like I mentioned, Magnaflow, uh, Speedcore that helped us tremendously with this last uh, last Fast 9 Charger that we built. Um, they were huge. They, they basically gave us uh, – they, they built a really nice chassis for us, and they built an incredible carbon fiber body. So they would show up here at my shop as basically a roller. And then uh, we would assemble it from there. Um, but for the most part, now everything's pretty much done in house. We do uh, we do body work. Uh, paint shop is paint is one thing that we do have to sub a lot of out. There's probably uh, you know three or four body shops I use. Uh, Jack's Auto Body is a place down the street. I've known the guy for going on 30 years. He's great. He'll work all night for us. Do whatever it takes. So there's a lot of uh, you know over the years. There's a lot of uh, a lot of contacts I have that know know that what we're up against and understand that there is no uh, 
hey, I'm sorry, it's not going to be ready. You know, that just that's not uh, that's not in the vocabulary. You just can't. Right. Uh, there's a lot behind every line to help make it happen. And uh, you know, and I have a great team of guys. You know, so and and I and I staff accordingly. I mean, we'll on a big car show, we'll have 40, 50 guys here. You know, all working on cars. You know, for 12, 13, 14, sometimes 15 hours a day, sometimes yeah. six a week. So, um, and, and it seems like I don't, I don't know why it is, but it seems like no matter how well I plan, we're always just crammed at the very end. You know, it's like, you know, uh, we start off, okay, this will be enough time to get everything done. But it seems like when you get to that last two weeks, you know, we're, that's when we're going big hours and seven days a week. It just always compounds to the point where you're uh, a mad rush. And part of that is because, on most of these projects, you know, I don't care what, what studio it is, but uh, it's so frequent that we're building cars, but the script is still being developed. So we might have one game plan and then all of a sudden that character comes in, or a character comes in or a location changes and the cars, the vehicle requirement is completely different. So that's one of the elements that always, uh, you know, adds to the, uh, you know, to the last minute stress. But wow. Let's so say, go ahead, go ahead, John. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's say you're doing a, a charger. You you uh, pick any car, and, and you're figuring out how many you're going to need as far as uh, outside shots, inside shots. Let's say that they want the actors to flip upside down in the car. How do you go about figuring out what that's supposed to look like? Uh, how many are there? I mean, is that easy easy for you at this point, or is that still paper to the the pen trying to calculate what that looks like? I think in the car counts pretty easy. I mean, we usually we usually don't miss on that. And I mean, if it's a, uh, I mean, I'll just I'll just go through a, a really uh, elaborate one um, that we just did that was uh, in a NASCAR race, and it's uh, a crash where the car kind of gets up in the fence. It's kind of like that Carl Edwards crash, you know, where he hits the fence, the car mm-hmm. breaks, all that stuff. It's kind of that feel and. That one segment, you know, from the time the car loses it and goes up into the wall to where it's sitting as a burning hulk on the track was, I think, 10 cars. Wow. Because it's all shot in different pieces, different elements of it. And that's, uh, really? you know, a joint venture between, you know, my department, special effects and uh, and stunts to make that all work. But, uh, you know, that's what people never realize. They might watch a you know, scene in a movie think man that was amazing and it might have been you know 40 seconds long but that took you know three weeks to put that one scene together in nine vehicles or whatever it is you know so there's this you have to you have to realize in a car crash every time you see like a different camera angle you know there's a good chance that was a different car you know because if it's crossing paths or whatever so you know you might want it from here you might want it there there might be an interior shot um and it might just be a situation where you can't get all that action in one take so it's it's shot in, in different bits and pieces so Right, a lot of work, but you know it's uh, it's worth the payoff in the end. Wow, that's cool. So I, I got to ask, and and I understand if you if if you can't answer it in nine, what's the deal with the mid engine charger? Uh, the, I saw a video that uh, Superfly Auto shot, and it's just freaking awesome. I think it's just cool. So what's the deal with that thing? So it it is an awesome car. It's like I said, I, I say this, I feel like on every movie, you know. This is my new favorite charger, but this one really, <laughs> like the off-road one, this is my favorite. Then the, you know, it just, it goes on and on. But um, I was just looking for something different. And, uh, you know, as always, I'm always out at SEMA and I'm always, you know, nosing around and seeing what, what's cool. And uh, I ran into my good buddies over Speed Corps and they were just showing me, uh, you know, something they were working on. Uh, it was uh, Sean Smith, one of their artists was, yeah, there you go, was drawing it. And uh, I loved it. I go, you know, this is it. It's just clean. It's nice. I, I said, I like the looks. It's not, it's not yeah. fast eight. Um, and I just really wanted that sixties vibe. You know, I wanted that sixties, uh, you know, kind of like a GT 40 feel to it. And yeah, I figured, you know, you start running out of ideas after, you know, after these, uh, you know, so many of these, uh, so many of these films, you have to come up with something different. So I thought it's just going to be really cool to put the motor behind this, behind the driver's seat. And uh, so that's basically what we did. Um, you know, Chrysler is a huge supporter of the franchise, and it's really as easy as picking up the phone and saying, "Hey, we need, uh, you know, I need three Hellcat motors," and boom, you know, there, there they are. So you need four, uh, you need four now. Four. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing, my only regret, and th- this was one of the things that was just too late to change it. If uh, I was started over again, I, I it's too low. I, I would have just raised the thing about 
another inch and a half. Um, too low. What are you talking about? What? <laughs> my is low. I thought that too when I first looked at it. It's hard to run that. But uh, the way we had the rear end set up with the independent suspension, we just couldn't raise it without getting into a CV issue. So, um, but it's great. But it, it is very low. You know, like I said, it's not a good driveway car. But. <laughs> and the wheels were cool. I don't know if you noticed the wheels, but they're, it's a it's a one-off HRE wheel with, with a true knockoff, which was another kind of a look I wanted to go for. And then, uh, you know, the fender uh, kind of being open at the rear of the tire was just, I don't know, you know, just kind of felt fast and furious, I guess. So, uh, yeah, all kind of come together and the color was cool and and it was incredibly We We tuned our car to uh, Dodge Demon Specs and, uh, you know, the only regret I have in this one is that was one of those, uh, you know, finish at the very last minute. I didn't really have a chance to, uh, you know, put that car through the paces, but I'm still planning on doing that. It's actually sitting here in my shop right now, so we'll actually get the thing out to the race and see what it can do. Yeah. So what one of one of one you using it? What What's transmission that? did you use in it? Totally a ball, 200 yards from uh, Burbank Airport, so that was a plane going by. So No, Sorry. no, no. What, what transmission did you use in, in the Charger? Uh, it's a Lamborghini six-speed. So it's uh, – Oh, Kind of a mercy a lot of it's uh i forget the exact name of the trans but it's uh you know it's a, basically becoming a lamborghini or an audi um so you, you, you probably don't want to you know put the thing at you know four grand and dump the clutch you know i wouldn't want to try that with it but <laughs> it's, a, it's a durable piece it'll you know it'll handle the horsepower you know you just you don't want to beat on it you know obviously yeah we, we we intended to build three of those we ran at a time we built two which was you know more was more than sufficient um, and then we built seven stunt cars uh, that had my, you know, the typical, you know, late model fuel injected motor, turbo 400, nine inch. We had a uh, fiberglass version of the uh, Hellcat motor placed in there. And, you know, on screen, they look great. You can't tell going by. Uh, Magnaflow bent us up some dummy exhaust that, you know, mimicked what was in the real car. And, uh, and it worked great. So, and that was what really too allowed us to, uh, it allowed those cars to survive filming. So they both really came out of it unscathed. Mm -hmm. Because we never put them in a, you know, in a dangerous position. You know, I, I and honestly, I haven't seen the final cut of the movie. I was out of town. I missed the premiere, but I'm hoping that there's some shots of the, uh, you know, some behind the behind the shoulder or something that shows that motor. Yeah. And belt spinning and all the good stuff. So hopefully, hopefully it comes off on screen uh, as to what we actually built as being a real car, and uh, you know, we'll see. But you know, luckily there's guys like you that we can talk about it, so people know what what goes into them. Yeah, that, that's yeah, pretty it, cool. It, that's a bad. It's just a badass car to me. It really is. I like it. I the first. I only saw it that one video that I a couple days ago, and, and it's just like yeah, it, it hit. It nailed it for me. It's got all the right pieces. You know, that's what I like. It's, there's just something cool about driving it too. I mean, it's weird too. You sit and drive, and there's no, uh, you know, there's no transom. It's just basically a flat full floor, and, right. it, and it's incredibly <laughs> loud. You know, the exhaust is awesome. You, you hear the motor noise through the piece of Lexan behind you. And just going through the gears going down the street, man, that car is it's a it's a fun driver. I mean, hopefully, like I said, that's a car that's a car I would love to end up with and I would actually go drive the thing around. Put a light yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I wouldn't you know, like you're saying, you wouldn't uh run up to nine grand and let it rip, but that that's yeah the keeper. No, I'm really yeah. that's yeah. tucked away. That's the beauty of those Hellcat motors, I man. They make all that horsepower and yet they'll start an idle all day. So it's just yeah, you know, it is a car you can actually drive. I think somewhere where they gave in Diesel, uh, it pro I think it was a Speed Core uh, Charger for his birthday or something. Do you remember seeing any of that? Know anything about it? I think it was on set. Uh, number eight. I sure did. Set and I and granted I, that was in London. I wasn't there that day, but uh, but yeah, Ben saw that car and you know he he truly appreciates you know fine machinery and that that car is gorgeous. You know so. Uh, and I knew, I knew when he saw that car, he was going to want because that car is much different than a picture car. There's no comparison to that car. And, you know, picture cars are kind of a little rough, a little crude, a little, you know, a little loud. You know, they're, you know, normally they're not something that you do want to drive every day. But that car is, you know, like you sit inside the car, it's like Mercedes leather and it's quiet. It's sound insulation. It's great. So, uh, so yeah, I knew, I knew that was coming. And uh, sure enough, when he saw it, he, he was dying for it. And his sister, Samantha, actually set that all up to, uh, actually give him the car for his birthday. So it was, I don't know, that's pretty cool. I, I've never had a birthday present that cool. So I was pretty yeah, no cool. kidding. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> no kidding. Jeez, that's wild. That's a yeah. good time. That's a good time. 
impressive collection too. He's, I gotta say, he's got ten or twelve cars in his collection. So, all right. So, so um, forty-five. You guys, if you want to call in, remember, remember the number is two one five four nine six eighteen ninety two. We're we're taking calls now. Remember, use common sense. Don't be a moron. <laughs> Dennis, you, you know, some of what you do reminds me of uh, Q from James Bond. You, remember, you know what I'm talking about, where he's got to explain to James Bond, this is what this lever does, this is this trick, this is how you drive this. Yeah. Which also, I mean, not everybody's James as smooth and as cool as James Bond was supposed to be. Yeah. Do you yeah. ever come across the, an actor, you don't have to name names, that you, you knew once they got in a the car, they didn't know shit about how to drive a stick or didn't know what they were looking at. You're like, oh boy, we may be in trouble. <laughs> you ever come across that? <laughs> and I know, I know they're putting it on a trailer. They're making it look like they're reading through their lines, but just, you know, they have to move it from A to B and you're going, oh, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. <laughs> and that is that the, uh, the most shocking things in this day and age is how few people actually drive a stick-stick car. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, just one story. I was doing a movie called War Dogs, and we were down in uh, El Centro by the border, yeah. and we had this uh, terrorist scene where there was a. I had a couple of like a couple Toyota Land Cruisers, and they just had to pull up and stop. They only had to drive like thirty feet for the shot. I was kind of making a roadblock, and I think there was like probably four, thirty or forty extras, you know, on set that day. And when they started asking, you know, who here can drive a six? This is like thirty or forty extras. None of them could. What? <laughs> You know, and it's like then the directors, you know, I mean, why'd you bring these cars with clutch pedals? It's like, well, that's the only way these old Land Cruisers came. There was right. no automatic. So, anyways, <laughs> we had to test a couple of my mechanics as terrorists and put them in the cars to. You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, it's just uh, that's what I was thinking. There was a story like that where you go, "What the hell? Now what?" Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, you really can't. I, I mean, I do blame them, but you know. Nowadays, it's so hard to find a manual transmission car. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah. My own mother, who's 75 years old, she drives a four series BMW, the manual trans that she leased, you know, three years ago. And she went to go, you know, turn to get another one, and they don't make it in a manual anymore. And so she bought it. She goes, I'm not driving. She's 75. She goes, I'm not driving. I'm not driving an automatic, so I'm going to have to keep this car. So that's anyway. awesome. There's yeah. um there was a commercial, I believe it was a Volkswagen commercial where these these two guys are riding around in the car all day, all these different driving shots. They pull up in front of the apartment building that they're going in, and they and they get to the door to go in, and the guy hits the fob, so it beeps, and the other guy goes, Hey man, the windows are down. He goes, It's a stick, and they go in the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the new theft deterrent, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that's what I did. That's what they were getting at. <laughs> the next, you know. <laughs> not far from the truth at all. <laughs> so funny, man. Yes. Did you have, uh, uh, God rest his soul, you have a chance to, to work with Paul Walker, get close, talk to him, get to know him? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, um, he was a true, true great friend and and one of the greatest guys you've ever met. I mean, just, you know, give you the shirt. He's, a, he's the uh, give you the shirt off his back kind of guy, you know, no doubt. So, yeah. Really, really a nice guy, though. I mean, just and truly into cars. He loved his cars. He loved driving cars. I mean, uh, you know, he had a business. He was going to make Porsche exhaust. I mean, he had. I mean, I think he liked cars more than he liked being an actor. You know, the acting just paid for his cars. But yeah, uh, paid for the hobby. Yeah, that's all. Real yeah, the, re the reason I bring that up is because I get the impression he's the exact opposite of what we just talked about—a guy that got in a car and doesn't know how to, you know, let the clutch out without popping it, and make it bounce all over the place. He seemed like he, he really lived the, the, you know, he played the role and lived the the, the life. Yeah, he would like to, he would prefer to be on the second unit stunt side of things for sure. You know, he just he loved driving cars, loved driving fast, and uh, you know, like I said, just a great guy. And it's uh, just last week I was talking with his brother Cody. We sent some cars out to his uh, fuel fest event out in Irwindale. So you know, his brother's a great guy and kind of keeping that legacy going on and uh, puts on a great event. So that's cool. That's very cool. So, what's the deal with Mustangs with Polaris, uh, Polaris drivetrains or Polaris chassis stuffed under them? What's the deal with that? Yeah, so that was just basically uh, like the uh, most challenging environment ever. It was down in uh, down in Thailand in the jungle. When I say jungle, I mean like the jungle. You know, like yeah, the yeah. Green, uh, this really sticky, weird red clay mud. So, uh, you know, when you read the script, and it's like, and that was actually. Uh, 
uh, a choice of Justin. He really wanted the Mustang. He felt it was a good car to counter the, uh, the Charger. So um, when I read that, I go, man, this, is, this isn't this is going to end well at all, you know. And I haven't been to Thailand, and my guys were calling me from there. He goes, dude, you're not going to believe, you know, how challenging this is. Even like in a four-wheel drive Jeep, it's challenging to drive through this. Right. <laughs> You know, we had to come up with something that would go anywhere. So uh, we took a Polaris 1000, and luckily, Speedcore makes a carbon fiber Mustang, which I don't know if you guys have seen that. I did not know that. Yeah, so they built, used to build like a late model carbon fiber Mustang. So they had all the body panels in carbon fiber. So oh. basically, a you know Speedcore carbon fiber body, and just put that on top of a uh, Polaris 1000. Once we altered the wheelbase. And we didn't have to do any interior. We just tinted the windows. So it was literally just a race seat and, you know, the relocated Polaris controls. And it, you know, obviously that's going to go anywhere. We even, the four wheel drive was still fully functional. And so you could still select from, you know, two wheel or four wheel drive. And then for the, uh, for the charger that's next to it, we took a, uh, I don't know if you ever follow a short course racing, but there's a class called Pro Light, which is a V8 powered, more like a mini truck size. Yeah. So we basically, Got a couple of ProLite race trucks, and you know, same thing. We didn't have to adjust the wheelbase surprisingly very much. It was just a couple of inches. Chopped the top of the cage off, and did take complete chargers and basically hollow them out and set that shell over the top of these uh, race trucks. And you know, then, boom! Then while out there, you got something that'll go anywhere. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Two two things, Dennis. Talk about flipping the Grand National so it could do seventy miles an hour in reverse. And the second you you were on the phone with me a couple of years ago, you were telling me about FedEx and a car to Europe because they wrecked it, needed one overnight, loaded the thing up. The paint was still wet. And I was laughing, going, man, it sounds cool until there's a crunch time where they're going to shut down production and your phone's ringing at 12 o'clock at night going, where's it at? Where's it at? Where's it at? Can you tell us about the Grand National and FedExing? Yeah. Well, the Grand National was a very cool that that was that was really uh, one of my favorite sequences too out of this out of this franchise. I mean, it was uh, that was kind of just all my favorite stuff wrapped up into one scene. You know, I, I mean, I love the old Chevy square bodies. I love the '67, '68 Chevy trucks. So it just kind of uh, it, that was early on. It just kind of gave me the opportunity to kind of do whatever I wanted. And uh, the one before I get to the Grand National, one of my biggest regrets of that scene was we built three of the. Uh, you know, six wheeled uh, square body trucks, but one yeah. of them threw uh, four wheel drive in the back. And, you know, we went out and tested and man, you could do donuts in that thing all day. The smoke was unbelievable. Just smoking all four tires, you know? And uh, I really wanted a shot of that thing, like parked on the side of the road and just coming onto the highway, you know, kind of sideways sliding, smoking all four tires. And uh, unfortunately that didn't make it into the movie, but uh Moving on, that was just still one of those things that I still cringe that it didn't happen because when you watch it, you would never know that it could actually spin all four tires. Um, and then the scene going backwards, obviously, it's at, uh, it's at a great deal of speed. And it's not even so much the speed. It's just in a situation like that, uh, Stunts has, you know, Letty actually literally on the hood of the car. So granted, she's cabled off. <laughs> but it's still, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a serious stunt. It's nothing that you can take lightly. So everything has to be as controllable as possible. So speed was one element, but the true reason for doing that is so the steering would be, you know, in the front of where the car was headed. So, uh, right. you know, and we, we do a lot of these cars. There's a lot of calls for backwards driving cars. And uh, in this particular case, it was just a matter of, you know, lifting the body off, spinning the body around and putting it back on. You know, luckily the, uh, those Buicks are a full frame car. So they're, they're very easy to work with. You know, obviously if it was a subframe car, we'd be scratching our heads a little bit longer on it, but uh, yeah, with a, with a real frame, you can, you know, flip it around and go. Um, How much time that take? I mean, that seems like it's intense. How much time would that take to flip that thing around and make it work? Uh, that was probably, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, two, three weeks, I would say max to do that. And we didn't really do much else. It, was, it was actually was a, I believe that was a Buick T-type. So yeah. yeah. You know, so it had some power, ran good. It was a beat when we got it, but uh, we didn't really put a great deal of effort into it other than just flipping it around and, uh, you know, making it go backwards. Hmm. Uh, and as far as, uh, as far as moving cars, uh, you know, with FedEx or, you know, whatever carrier we're using, uh, that's been done more, much more times than just once, you know. it's uh, And it's usually, I'll say most of the time, it's not due to uh, destroying a car or wrecking a car. It's usually more to... Uh, you know, an evolving story, or we need another car here, or hey, we want this car in this location. So, 
Uh, that's done all the time on multiple, multiple different films. Um, you know, like I said, not out of the order and, and very expensive. You know, we, yeah. all the yeah. film right now, we just had a quote. It was actually moving some large trucks, uh, you know, across, across the world, really. Uh, but it was a million dollars to get a plane that would handle it all. We came up with a plan. A million dollars wasn't spent. But, you know, I'm just saying that's, that's, that's one of those things that does come up quite frequently. You know, and uh, oh. if planned right, I mean, a lot of times if you plan it correctly, you say, hey, we're going to fly the cars, you can literally rent out an entire 747 back with cars. And if you have the whole plane yourself, uh, financially, it's not that bad. Uh, but definitely comes in handy when you're on a tight schedule and you're in multiple locations. Man, that's crazy. So who are your favorite actors to work with? And what was your what's your favorite car besides the mid-engine charger? Uh, I'm not going to single out an actor because then all the other ones go, hey, man, I thought I was your favorite. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that, but yeah, I get it. No, but I, I, I'm a podcast host. They're, they're all great. I mean, I mean, I'm just trying to think through... Uh, you know, I can't say I've worked with anybody that I don't like. You know, I mean, they've all been right. really cool. I mean, uh, I did work with Pierce Brosnan on a film once. He was extremely cool. It, you know, James Bond reminded me of him. When you, when you say a really cool guy like James Bond, he really is like James Bond. He's that cool. Um, and obviously the whole cast of the uh, Fast and Furious franchise, I mean, they're all, you know, they're all great. And they are, you know, I mean, I know the word family is overdone, but it's uh, it really is. You know, we come back to these movies and it's everybody knows. Right, them. right. Uh, but no, I, I really haven't worked with anybody that I can say that I that I didn't like, um, you know. So uh, yeah, it's always it's always been a great experience. But that's, uh, cool. that's way cool. Now we know uh, you got the. Uh, I saw the, the trailer. You got a '86 Fiero with a jet engine on it, which looks like it's Back to the Future almost. Uh, Right, that yeah. car and the mid-engine. What else are we going to see in Fast Nine? Uh, that you can highlight. That's got, I mean, that's, I, I saw the trailer. It looks like it's shooting through the air or, or something crazy. And I'm like, all right, okay. And I know, you know, that's an older car. I mean, that's 86 yeah. is a, a million miles away from now. Uh, Dennis, you know, what, what else are we going to see in, in nine coming out? And are you working on 10 now? Or is 10 you know, around the corner? Just coming up. So uh, I won't say I'm working on it yet, but that's uh Dangerous, dangerously close, you know. Dangerous close, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, regarding the Fiero, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. That wasn't that, that car was not my idea. Um, and I, I was just someone just asked me that yesterday. You know, what, what's behind that? And I really have to ask Justin. I do know that it was uh, definitely going to be a Pontiac Fiero. So uh, I'm not sure what the significance, but I think it's uh, my my guess is it's just the uh, the comedy aspect of it. You know, it's just a funny car. Gotcha. So, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's something you've never seen before. You know, if you're with a jet strap on the top of it, so yeah. What's it? What's in nine that you're proud of? And uh, I, I, you know, we could go another two hours, really, because I, I, I want to know if have they ever approached you and you went, "What do you want it to do? How do you want it to do?" Do what? You know what I'm saying? Going, are you? I can't make that. We don't have in nine that you're proud of. That you need to see this, so it teases the film, so it does what you do. Yeah, I mean, nine's full of great stuff. I mean, it really is. And I mean, sometimes, sometimes I like to go just back. Uh, I like to back up a little bit into more basic cars. For instance, uh, you know, if you've seen the trailer, uh, you see Letty in a in a Nova. You know, and it's just, it's one of those cars when you see it, it's not really elaborate. It's not really over the top. There's no body modifications. It's just a cool old, you know, an old school hot rod, as I like to call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, beyond that, there's some great off road stuff in Act One. Um, and, and oddly enough, Fast 9 doesn't have quite the volume of cars as some of the past ones. Really? Um, now, I mean, there's a lot of cars and the action's bigger, but as far as, uh, you know, it seems like a lot of the sequences don't have quite as many cars as we would normally have for like a hero action vehicle piece. But uh, what we do have is, you know, it's, it's all great stuff. You know, we, we brought the new Super back. That was something that I just felt was kind of a, the timing was right. It had just come out, and you know, Toyota Super has always been, as we know, by the five hundred fifty thousand, kind of iconic towards the franchise. So uh, that's a car that you know Han drives in the, in the series. Um, in the opening act, we had some really, really cool, uh, basically off-road race cars that were kind of the villain vehicles that are, uh, you know, facing down Dom and Letty. Uh, we brought the motorcycle element into it with some Yamaha four fifties, uh, an awesome bike. It's uh, 
actually, you know, a same bike that two of my kids ride, you know, out of the desert all the time. So, uh, you know, once again, I always seem to get a lot of my favorite things into these movies. Um, and I, I, sorry, I, I blew over your question of what my other favorite car is. And uh, that's once again, that's one of those hardest questions because I, I don't know, maybe my mood changes or times change and I, I move around on that one a lot. It's kind of a moving target. But uh, one thing that you reminded me of in that one little uh, clip you pulled up there of the uh, Tokyo Drift Warehouse was at Monte Carlo. That really was one of my all-time favorite cars. You know? yeah. yeah. Kind of a car I built as, as if I were going to build it for myself. Uh, less the primer and the unfinished metalwork on it. That was one thing that, you know, I kind of went back and forth with. Saying, you know, a car guy wouldn't really roll out with an unprimered, unpainted fender and roof, you know, because it's right. like, I said, the, you know, I, I was, I was, I was shooting for, you know, matte black primer, went to the, you know, the tan primer. Okay, fine. But uh, obviously I lost that battle because the car, you know, has a, uh, yeah. we went through a lot of clear coat to keep that stuff. Cause, and, and it's actually true. You know, if you left a raw seal roof the next morning, it's going to be a different color. Yeah. I, so, uh. But that was a really cool car that I'll, you know, that I'll always remember because it was really, that was really the first car ever in my career of doing this that I was able to build something that I really dig, you know, build something the way I wanted to, uh, yeah. the way I wanted it to be, you know. And there was uh, a couple cars were really nice. One car in particular, oddly enough, I just, you know, regained possession of it. It moved around to I think four or five different owners, and uh, you know, some guy tracked me down out of Oklahoma. Said, "Hey, I've seen you." I know you like this car. Do you, you want to buy it back? And I'm like, hell yeah, I want to buy it back. So anyways, wired some money, sent a truck out to grab it. And it's, you know, currently in my shop right now, just uh, being restored. So that's awesome. That's cool. That's cool that the guy did that for you. Yeah. Well, you know, Dennis, I hate to say this, but our time is up, man. Hey, it was a pleasure. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I had a great time just chatting with you. It was good. So. Dennis, we're gonna we're gonna have to have you back, especially you know. And we talked about this before. I don't know if you remember years ago, but I could never understand why even Universal, NBC, or anybody doesn't do a series just on you building these cars. You yeah, know, I, I I ran to you know Motor Trend said, "Listen, you guys are missing out because some of these 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 movies are doing a billion dollars as a built-in audience." And to be able to drop this series just before its release seems like a no-brainer to me. I mean, I'm no genius, but to go, this is what you're going to see. This is the workup. Here it is. And then have the movie drop in a week seems like it makes fucking sense. I mean, really. Why would you not? Especially if you're a car guy. Because the movie was based on, I mean, it's car guy stuff. Yeah. It's definitely, I mean, you're not, you're not into it because of the explosions. You're into it because of the car stuff and the characters. Yeah. I mean, no, it just seems to make sense. You're, you're totally right. And, the, and the, the bummer is that a lot of the car guys never see what's under the skin of these things. You know, I, I know that right. uh, I'm sure we'll take this minute to charge it to seam in somebody's booth, but I want to, you know, lift the hood off a thing, you know, kind of like the old, uh, you know, Plymouth Roadrunner style where it's, you know, mm -hmm. up or whatever, and pull the rear hatch off maybe the same way just so people can see, you know, what really goes into it. Uh, I, I try to do that with that. You mentioned Magnaflow and the Batmobile. I pitched this to Warner Brothers. I said, hey, we had two of those cars. Let's have one there, you know, as you know, as seen on film. Let's do the other one with no body on it. But that was that was a no sale. But it would just, uh, you know, I think people would really appreciate it if they saw what. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because then, you know, that's that's because the suits don't get it. They're not car guys. They don't own a toolbox. They're like, here, you own a toolbox. You figure it out. But the suits don't understand what the key to that is. And the further, I'm going to be serious here. The further fast gets away from racing and cars and gets it more into the sci-fi shit. It's going to fade out. And I know number 10 is supposed to be the last one, right? You never know. You know, we'll yeah. see. I, I know. If, if making a billion dollars a film, they're going to figure something out. I get yeah, it. They're going to want to stick around. But the, from what I, 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 is, is I hope not because I love doing it. So hopefully. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. Dennis, before we let you roll, what are you working on now that, you know, we can look forward to and keep an eye on going forward? Who do we follow on Instagram to see your work and see what's happening? And who, who what's What's going on? You know, I'm going to have to get like uh, my own uh, social media guy because I just, uh, I'm not good at it. And I, I don't think I've posted anything for like seven years or something. So I, I have to catch up on that. It's one of these days. But uh, yeah. yeah, we're doing a couple of couple of big projects right now. One of them, I, I can't really talk about it, but it's, uh, it's a big car movie. It's um, it's with a difference to you. It's, it's huge, though. It's going to be massive. And it's, uh, you know, outside of a Fast and Furious movie, it's one of these uh, franchises that has more cars than anything else. And uh it's been a real blast. And then I did mention my, my good friend, uh, 
JJ Perry. We're doing this really cool uh, stunt movie, and I know he won't mind me talking about it, but it's uh, it's a movie that's action packed, kind of old school. It's going to be great. You guys are going to love it. Um, so you know, the the fun never stops. It just uh, it just keeps getting more challenging. I guess is the best way to put it. But yeah, yeah. Guys, keep, yeah. keep this alive. Don't let it go. The, the next generation, two or three, has got to be into it like we are for sure. Otherwise, they're looking at their phones with their nose pressed up against the screen. Thinking, yeah, I got, this well, is what life's about. Yeah, so yeah, they, and they've all got a muscle car, and they've all got, and every every one of my kids' cars has a clutch belt. So <laughs> there yeah. you go. I mean, you got to. I mean, when we were kids, American Graffiti was a shit. The whole car was just. I mean, the whole movie was just about cars. Nowadays, you know, everybody's got a cell phone and don't go out and don't do no bicycle. No ranches, no nothing. Yeah, I appreciate, I, mean, I, I appreciate what you do. I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Listen, the door is always open. We're working on a project worth talking about, hit us up. Come on back because there's at least two more hours just right now to be able to talk about a little bit the future. And you got it. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come on your show, man. It's been a blast. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Dan. Appreciate it, man. Talk to you a little bit. All right, everybody. Next week is Troy Ladd, and we're doing Power Tour. So I got to get with DEI. We're going to ham hammer out a few things with that, and then we're good to go. If you want to get with us, if you want to email us, you can always do it at three lefts, don't, no apostrophe, at gmail.com. That's Gmail. And the other thing is we got, um, I, 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 I think I said it earlier, but I made a faux pas. It's Tom, Tom Bailey, <laughs> the guy with the fastest streetcar. I feel bad hey, Tom about Davis. it. Huh? I think I messed that up. I was looking through no, text I, messages it's, it's, trying to I keep the camera. I, don't know. I might have said it, it, but it's fine. But anyway, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. Next week, Troy Ladd of Hollywood Hot Rods. Come by, share, like, do all that stuff that you do. Tell your friends, all right? Remember, the only way this is going to grow is with your help. And we'll see you guys next week. John, say goodbye. Later, goodbye. For more than 25 years, DEI has been controlling heat and sound, all with products developed to protect components and drivers alike, and has become the standard by which all heat and sound control is measured. Each product is developed with solutions to problems in mind. DEI knows when it comes to making and keeping horsepower, heat is the enemy. Innovative technology allows us to develop the highest quality products, quality driven, and that's why the best builders and race teams in the world use DEI.